What is up, guys? We're back with a brand new sound device. I'm so excited because not only do I have Justin, who's always with me, he's down there that way, but I also have Dylan from Buckeye Amps. And Dylan has told me that they're the best amplifiers in the world. So we want to find out what's going on with Buckeye. I had a feeling you must have been from Ohio because of Buckeye. I'll, I'll, right? say, I'll say they're they're built using some of the best amplifier technology in the world. Ah. Um, I, I won't, true. I'm very modest with my product, but I'll, you know, for the money, I don't think you can go wrong. I really don't. No, I, so interestingly enough, I had actually not heard of Buckeye amplifiers. It's kind of funny. Uh, one of my patrons who we talk all the time, home theater, because I'm a big home theater guy. And for some reason, even on ABS forum, I just somehow missed it. I have no idea how. And he said, oh, you should look into Buckeye amps. Cause I was telling him some amplifiers I was looking at. And I was like, Buckeye. And I looked it up and I was like, wait, they use Purify and Hypex? And we actually just talked about this last last week, didn't we, Justin, about Purify and Hypex? Briefly and so, a little bit. Um, it's, just it's, I'm not that familiar with these home audio amplifier modules, so we can we need to talk more about them, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah. So before we get started, one thing I do want to say, uh, guys, if you have a question, throw it in the chat and we'll try to answer those. And just so you know, if you really need to get your question answered, Super Chat's the only way we can guarantee that it shows up. I'm not telling you to Super Chat. I'm just, just reminding you that. Uh, so, Dylan, I wanted to talk about your history because you kind of have a pretty unique background. You actually started in DIY, correct? Yes. Well, yeah. So, for how this business started, I was actually, um, I guess to rewind, I really got into the audio video about 2011, and um, I had a rough kind of health issue while I was doing my undergrad, so I was at home a lot, and I was like, oh, I have this 5.1 setup, but I really want to bring it up. I'm at home. I play a lot of games, so I got, that's when I first started getting into AVS and learning the ins and outs. You know, I was a very, I was really um, a noob, if you want to say it that, like, I was the guy like, oh, does speaker wire matter in terms of cost? Like, getting the, the download to make sure I didn't waste my money, like, okay, you know, the right gauge is all that matters. You don't need to pay $500 for audio quest at Best Buy, that type of stuff. And then I just got into the hobby and kept growing it. And I was one of those people that was constantly changing out equipment. And one of the things I was always changing out was amplifiers for mm -hmm. years and years and years. I kept going through amplifiers and it's not that nothing was, it's not that anything was bad. It's just, I was always wondering, am I missing something? So, I mean, I, I, I'd went from Anthem MCA series to their statement P series and a series. I've done Emotiva. I've done outlaw. Um, and then finally fast forward, that was for a long time. Finally, I was uh, three years into my PhD um, and the lockdown happened the, with quarantine. Mm -hmm. So I was actually at home uh, for a good three months, not in the lab because we weren't considered essential. So we were kind of doing work from home and I decided, all right, well, I want to try one more time, you know, tinker with my audio setup. I've been kind of happy with it. And I found a good price on a used um, ATI uh, amp that used at the Hypex modules, which I didn't know much about at the time, but I had read, then I started reading. I was like, all right, well, these sound really great. ATI is using them. This has a lot of power. It's really clean. So I bought it used and it was the one of the greatest things I like, it just worked. I didn't have any questions about it, but the price to me was like, I was like, wow, this is great. But it reminded me of when I had an Anthem statement amp. Like it was a lot of money mm. when I then saw that, oh, wait, there's people that are building the same exact amps, the same uh, measurements, the same everything for, uh, you know, half or a third of the price. And I started looking into those companies. I won't bring them up by name, but the only other one at the time that was in America, I was really interested in. Cause like, all right, well, he's in the backyard. I can buy from him. And then there was a few things I came across when I started reading the forums where I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to go that route. So then I started researching, well, what if I just build my own? Because people have been doing that with the 400 series Hypex. So I kind of got in touch with Hypex and I said, I'm kind of interested in building my own, but it would be kind of a trial to see, you know, if this worked out and it, and it held up measurements wise and sound wise to what I ex had heard before and what I'd expect, I'd actually like to become another dealer in the US for you guys because there's a lot of European companies that are doing this or people based in Europe, but only one so far in the U S and uh, yeah. it was fine. I, I uh, worked on my own little and, and people, this was something that'll come up probably even tonight's chat. 
At the time, I worked on my case, which it was an ugly case. And even to this day, <laughs> I've upgraded them a little bit. They're ugly. Um, put it together. Loved how it sounded exactly like I remembered of the ATI. It was just how it should be. Um, and I got the process down and basically was working with someone who was helping me do measurements at the time before I even sent it to Amir. And I realized, all right, this, even though I'm doing my PhD, we were just getting back in the lab. This is something I want to do. I started off doing this as I wanted it as an opportunity for people in the community like me to have access to uh, AMP using these modules, but built properly based on not just what I think is proper, but what is actually proper with feedback from the community. Like at the time, sure. uh, the debate on, well, not even the debate of how to properly wire pin one for XLR. And I was like, well, I'm going to follow this to the how it should be done because other people weren't or they didn't. They would say, well, it doesn't matter how we wire it because it barely makes a difference. That my approach was do it correctly. And at first I thought this would be more of a DIY business of like, hey guys, I'm building these amps for people that want them, you know, um, didn't think it would turn into a, a big business. I thought it might be kind of a, a couple of amps every week, maybe, you know, 10 or 20 a month at most. And then it just kept growing. And once the first review came out from Amir and people were like, wow, this is great. His prices are fantastic. They perform just the same as something that's four or five times as much. Um, yeah. Minus the looks. Uh, <laughs> once once people started catching on to that and just, I guess it was also me that maybe once people started talking to me more, like I'm not, I'm not pushing people to buy add-ons to my amps that pocket me money that do nothing for you. I'm not doing boutique stuff. I'm not here if you if you email me i'll tell you honestly like no you don't need a five channel purify amp you only need three purify channel uh, three channel purify for your front speakers because your surround speakers won't hear a difference in that save your money like that's me i'm trying to help the customer i think that attitude along with just you know the lower cost and um kind of catching on it i buy about this time last year oh maybe about 18 months ago from now, so about halfway into my business, about 18 months in my business, because I'm just at three years, I realized, no, I want to turn this into a business business. Like, I want to keep this growing. I mm -hmm. could have finished on my PhD, which I did, but I was this was going to be my focus when I was done with my PhD and continue it forward. So that might answer some people's questions who watch, because every now and then I still get, how much longer are you going to be around? Well, I'm not going anywhere unless for some reason something happened to the business, but I'm here to grow Buckeye and to keep it going forward. So there's that answer. Um, That's a great question. And you know, the, it reminds me of an article I once read a long time ago by Audioholics. So Audioholics wrote this article. And this was probably maybe 15, 20 years ago. This is when ice power was really big. And they, it was called uh, the clone amps. And so they were going off of the clone wars of star Wars and yeah. they were all using the exact same ice power module in them. And some of them might have had a little bit different, you know, like capacitor buildup or something, but most of them are exactly the same. And yet the price difference was like one was 1300 and one was like 7500. And the difference was, the, like you said, the case, like that was it. The measurements, they would measure almost yep. identical. And so you were paying for the name brand in the yep. case. And that's what I find so interesting about your amplifiers, because first of all, I don't really... I don't, I think they're, I think they look nice. And I like the fact that you offer powder coating yep. uh, for the different colors. But the thing that I like about them is that it's function over fashion, right? Like you right. care about function more than anything else. Like how are these going to perform in your system? And are you going to get something that's worth what you're paying? I bring up I, my, my, not inspiration, but my, what I remind people of subwoofers to me, it, when you can get a good looking subwoofer, we all talk about the uh, wife acceptance factor, stuff like that. But even the, the best subwoofers out there, like for an internet direct are just black boxes that are meant to sit there, not be terribly, terribly <laughs> ugly, but they just sit there, but they do their job exceptionally well. And they do it like you can get a sub one, or I don't know what they call it now from paradigm, which is a great sub for $10,000. Or you could get a rhythmic FV18, which is just a black box that does the same exact thing for one eighth the cost. And that's kind of how my amps are. And I tell people, I said, there's some I understand, especially two channel users that want that love to have their stuff out on display. And, and I understand that um, 
I mean, especially it's kind of, it's, I think it's more relevant now or more um, comes up more when people bring up my cases because now that class D itself, not just my M's, class D is showing people what it's capable of and that you don't need to pay for class A or solid state or class A, B or solid state that a lot of people that had those setups that were the older, you know, solid state class AB, like a Macintosh with all the, how nice the front looks. They're coming from that and they have these setups that showcase that and they still want to showcase it. But it, I'm not, then I, if that's your goal, then, then my product's not for you. I understand that. Um, but for majority of people, like I use my own amps in my setup and they're in a salamander open cabinet. You, yeah, it's maybe my little bit of bias, but even if I'm just looking directly at my cabinet, they just blend in. It's not like I'm, Hey, I, they, it's not like they stick out, I guess is what I'm saying. And a lot yeah, of people I, agree with me. They're like, it's just a black box that sits somewhere in your AV rack and it amplifies. So th this is kind of the look of them. And we talked about how you can do, which I like, you can do the, the custom paint job if you want to. Some people even did some two tone stuff, but they're, they're nothing like that. They're not, I mean, let's just be honest. They're nothing like this amazing piece of art to look at, but they're not yeah. anything ugly to look at either. I mean, it's, it looks like a black, a black metal box. Like, I don't care. <laughs> to, me, to me, it's, I guess it's, uh, it's, um, I'm, I'm bad with the word at the moment. It's, I want to say bland, but it's like neutral. There you go. Yeah, because neutral, yeah. if you took this box like this and put some weird, analog meter or something on it then yeah it would actually stick out and look a lot uglier in my opinion because to do like analog meters or something you need a case that accents it fits it but that's why ours is just like even our uh the logo on the front is kind of smaller our power led is just a little tiny led hole there on the left you can barely see it like nothing is meant to draw your attention to it but that's also the point it just sits there and does its job but it also allows you to put the money where yes. the importance is. And the importance is the amplifiers, right? Yes. Yeah. So you can say, so, so I'm going to touch on, you brought up how you're talking about those Clone War amps that, you know, the name alone or, or the name in a case allowed people to jack up the price. Um, yeah. The, the one, it's kind of funny that I look at the market now before I, I, the company, my, the company got big Buckeye amps. Um, no other European companies offered, you know, value models. They they had their cases and they had their prices that were always above mine. And, and I had a laugh recently because I've seen a few of them finally release some value models, like lower end cases, and their prices have come down. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, they could have done that from day one. We all know why they didn't. Um, but then they're, the dig now that my amps have measured the same as theirs and performed the same is now I have um, someone who keeps bringing up in the forums um, well, we had to discontinue our Hypex lower end amps because apparently people valued, you know, just having it slapped in a box rather than a nice looking case that could cool also. And I have to laugh at that because, um, ours, I've, I've been doing this for three years. I've sold over well over thousands of amps and cooling has not been an issue. Um, so it's like, I, I try not so to be that guy. Like I said, I'm, I'm not saying names or companies or anything, but it's like, you shouldn't have to go into the forums and, yeah. and nitpick to get sales. You're doing, in my opinion, you're doing something wrong. That's just my opinion. I mean, Justin, we've never, we've never come across people nitpicking us. Have we? With our no, DIY it's stuff? never happened. Never. I've, I've no, never no. had anyone jump in a video and tell no. me I was doing something wrong or they didn't like the way that I do things. That never no. happens. Dylan, I got a couple of questions. I, I think I told you, you did. Well, I, for, first, before you go there, <laughs> like, look at, just, just this particular amplifier, the Hypex NC502, right, which I know right. we've been talking a lot about. The, I mean, look how much of the, like, look at the cooling on that already. I mean, that's, so, and I think and that, that probably comes with the module, right? No, no. we that The module is just the, so if you look at like the six channel NC502, you can see that it's just the modules, the one next okay, to it on your see. left. Yeah, there we go, right here. Oh, uh, okay. So there is no cooling. Those are the modules. There. So oh. that's a standard, you know, in a case horizontal configuration. That eight channel you showed up was when we finally, first of all, to fit eight channels of NC502 in a case that I've always tried to keep my cases no wider than 17 inch because that's kind of a standard for a typical AV rack um, cabinet, right. not a right. not a rack right. mount. Um, to do that, I had to put them vertical, but that also allowed me if I do them vertical and you give up a, a little more height in the case, um, we 
I, those are custom heat sinks and um, standoffs, uh, L brackets to get extra cooling because those are pulling a lot of wattage. And it's the nice thing is with my amps, you can request, even if you're doing like a four channel build, you could request to pay a little more money and say, hey, I want the case with this for a little extra cooling. It's not that you need it, um, but it does help at Peace least with this mind. configuration with those four modules in there. That's if you're running um, a really, really low impedance, really difficult to drive setup, they'll be pulling a lot of wattage and they will get pretty hot. Uh, something like Magna Planes or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, and I will say any mag people with Maggies out there, the 502 is one of the most popular, like a two-channel 502 for Maggies or the Purify two-channel if you have a little more money. But yeah, the 502s, I've never heard a complaint for anyone who's gotten them and they have Maggies. They they work great. I, I love as well, and Justin, I want you to ask your question. Sure. I love this as well that you put two power, jack, you know, you're, you're making sure they get enough amperage. Um, and and I'll have, oh, yeah. I want to comment on that too. You don't yeah. need two dedicated circuits for this amp. There's two power inputs, but part of that is because with the internal wiring, we didn't want to run four power wiring, like split mm. it off one IEC inlet. It was more for internally to be on the safe side to double up the power wiring. But even with this amp, if, you, if you're if you running all eight channels, unless you're running a sine waves at maxing out um, decibels, <laughs> You do not need more than one dedicated outlet for your home theater. And I say is that this... as someone who I have a 20 amp outlet that's running two of my amplifier. That's running 13 channels of amplification of my Buckeyes. It's running an 85 inch TV. At one point it was running a 4,400 um, watt funk sub and never had an issue. So that's another thing I like to bring up for people is I think sometimes because people might be coming from class A, B or class A amps, um, with class D, you, you, a lot of people kind of overthink or overshoot what they need for power and you don't need to do that. You'd be That's surprised what you can run off a typical U S 15 amp, 20 amp, um, 120 circuit with home theater equipment nowadays. Justin, do you want to say something, man? Lots of things to say. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> I got started in the DIY thing, uh, for, many reasons one reason was to save money and that's not to say that doing diy is cheap i don't think it's turned out cheap for me in the end but the goal with a diy project is to make something that's awesome that's going to cost you a lot less than if you went out and bought something that's equivalent i think about the thing that nick kind of the videos that really blow up on his channel are the ones where he says hey i'm going to show you how to make this ten thousand dollar speaker for a thousand dollars in parts yeah. And it, it's interesting because looking at what you're doing, coming at it from the kind of the car audio, car audio perspective, it's really rare for someone to do their own amplifier. Mm -hmm. DIY means buying an amp off the shelf, wiring it up. And, and I'm looking at this amp and thinking about the cooling and it's like, yeah, car audio amps don't have that much cooling. They're just sitting there on a heat sink. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if those things, they generate a lot of heat and you, you've got plenty of cooling in that, but, um, but I'm looking at what you're building and it's, it's completely foreign to me. Once you crack open an amplifier, I don't have a clue what I'm looking at. Um, and so these modules are, what are the two brands? There's Hypex and Purify. What the heck is that? But back up a little so, bit and bring it back down. What are those? What does it even mean? So they're both class D. Hypex was actually started. Um, the Hypex had a kind of a, a journey or a, iteration over the year where they had their UCD series hype packs, which are used in a lot of, um, especially subwoofers They They were kind of, okay, I'll back up a little more of class D. We all know class D for car audio, for home audio. It became big when people started putting like crown amplifiers in their home theaters. But this was back, you know, 15 years ago where you'd get immense power, but then you'd also get right. a lot of noise floor and you'd be like, wow, I can hear static from the speakers when nothing's playing. And that's why right. class D initially for home theater was like the, the crowds, the class AB amp people were like, you, they're just not good. Don't do it. Hypex comes along and they come out with their UCD series, which improved on those um, trade-offs with class D, you know, lower noise floor, still getting good output. And then Hypex came out with their N core. And that's what the, one of my modules is the N core, the, um, the MP series, which means the MP series basically has the amp module and the power supply section all on one, modular mm -hmm. thing so the encore changed the game for them and that was um kind of a brainchild of bruno who 
he designed it. And, and when you measure it and you look at it and everything it can do, it really brought class D down to the, the up to the same level of class AB. The noise floor was basically um, up, it, at least for the, like the, the N, the NC 400, the NC 500, you were above 100 decibels for the noise floor. Your distortion um, was right around 105, 110 when you're measuring Synad. Um, so that was kind of like the, the Encore from Hypex was the start of that. And like I said, they, they had a few iterations within the Encore. The first was the NC400, then the NC500. Then we have the NC MP series, which is one of the ones I use. That's the all-in-one, the easier one to build. Their newest one is the NCX500. So that's basically the new generation of the NC500. And that's at a level of noise floor and distortion that we're well past where you can hear it. Now, when you're measuring, you're basically measuring to see who can get the best numbers because um, you can measure an NCX 500 with a THD um, of up to about uh, 126 decibel, which it's well above thresholds. Um, but what happened where Purify came in is Bruno actually left um, Hypex um, right after the NC 400, NC 500 was made. And then started Purify and came out with his what the Egan Tech technology. So if you could consider Hypex, their Encore is their top end Class D technology. Purify has they came out with their Egan Tech. Um, Egan Tact. I'm always going to say it wrong. And he came up with this new module that at the time was the best. It it the noise floor, the uh, distortion, crosstalk, everything was just phenomenal. And that's when Class D finally. That's when you saw people like Nad uses purify a lot now um lingdorf i believe just came out with some purify based amplifiers so that's when people in the higher end community where you would think of these amps that were always class a b those companies start saying all right this is the real deal we're going to start building these class d um so that's the 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 after e after the purify one et 400a came out just now the ncx 500 from hypex came out and i tell people the that's basically pure or hypex is um uh, answer to the Purify. So if you want to break it down into the best of the Class D, Hypex, the NCX500, and the Purify 1 ET400A are like the top top tier Class D. And so I feel... Okay, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I feel like a lot of people, when we talk about Class D, for some reason, the, the number one thing that they focus on is power. Power, power, power. Which is which is fine. But, the, and this is where me and Justin were having a discussion an argument <laughs> <laughs> a heated discussion on air last week because his opinion was and we were talking about car audio and i can't remember what what it is that you said maybe get better speakers and i said well no if you get a really really right. good amplifier it can last you for a really 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 long time like just get a really good amp i'd rather have the really good amplifier because they can make the speakers sound better period um but and, and so we had that that discussion and he didn't agree with me and and I I don't care. Um I did care actually, but but I, I really do believe that. And so there is a big difference though between all the different class D amplifiers, isn't there? There is so so there's more than them. So, like I said, Hypex started this new iteration with the Encore, and this was back in 2015-ish where before that it was kind of just power. Like if you looked at class D before and then it was, you're looking at for power and you're saying, all right, I can trade off the noise floor because I'm driving, you know, PA speakers, I'm driving really hard or I'm in a car, car audio setup. So the Encore was basically saying, no, we can give you power, but now we're giving you ultra low distortion, a really high noise, like the noise floor is almost silent. We're giving you crosstalk. We're giving you, you can go down to two ohms. We'll drive the hardest speakers all in this little package that is efficient cools well um and actually doesn't cost too bad and then purify one upped it and now hypex is matching the purify one upping so now we're in nitpick that's why i say now with the new everything that's coming out with the hypex and purify they're basically it's almost a race who can have the best measurement numbers because audibly it starts to become non-existent but then you have so, ice power ice power is another class d who they've throughout the years have kind of steadily been getting better they've they're always great for subs they they put out tremendous power um, but they've always had kind of a little bit of a higher noise floor and a little bit more distortion that's made them a little lacking behind Hypex and Purify, but they're even, um, you know, kind of evolving their generation of technology where it's getting better. 
And then Pascal based ones are also the same where a tremendous power, but at a trade off for a little bit of kind of when you start doing measurements um, at the, and again, the measurements may not be audible to like, so, so there are certain thresholds where it's audible, not audible, depending on if you have golden ears, people want to talk about that, but on a whole, the class D on a whole is, on, is a lot better than where it ever was. Um, but then obviously because of how cheap you can manufacture and how easy, simple it is, then obviously you're going to get a lot of like topping has um, their pre has their integrated stuff. But when you look at stuff like that, theirs is more aimed at low. That's not high wattage, you know, with uh, great distortion, and low noise flow. That's just kind of, you know, here's a 60, 70 watt integrated for someone that's running a simple setup. So, so the topping SMSL, yeah. um, Fossey, those types of companies. So if you right, need a, right. like, yeah, I, I mean, um, our people that already know our, our two channel integrated, it might draw some people away from those, but those are always gonna be hard things. Like it's not, economical to try and target them as uh, a competitor to try and, you know, steal any business from because what they're doing is taking the benefits of class D, but kind of shrinking it down to a lower price point and saying, you know, I have a two, I have a, a lot of like, if I have a, a work setup, you know, I have my office with two channel music. I just play throughout the day. I just want a simple integrated because I'm running some bookshelves at like, you know, 50 decibels max listening. You don't need a purify for something like that. So it makes sense. So, you know, it's Justin, interesting. I've tested a, some of those a, little chip amps. Yeah, the chip I, amps. I've tested some of those little chip amps. And I and I can honestly say that I'm horribly disappointed by these things, partly because of how they market themselves. They all say that they're 600 watts or 300 watts by two. <laughs> and you, you, Capable. You, you, you get about 40 watts out of them. I've got a little handheld amp dyno that I can do a test just for power. And <laughs> power is really the only thing that I can measure. So Dylan, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, there's an old car audio guy from back in the day who well, used to used to win car audio competitions, built his own digital signal processor before DSPs were things you could even buy off the shelf. His name was Richard Clark. And he used to run a Buick Grand National, right? The, the old sports car from the... You know, that Buick that's like, oh, that looks like a slow old Buick. No, it's faster than the Corvette. At the oh, time. yeah. You yeah. Those cars? I know it sounds, yeah. So Richard Clark was the guy's name. And his backstory is he was, um, he did something in the audio world that wasn't related to car audio. He did some pro audio stuff. He had a company that, that made CDs. So if you had, you know, music on a CD, he could stamp out CDs. Okay. And so his story was he bought a car and paid some some shop to put a stereo in it and spent a ton of money and wasn't really impressed by what he got and got to look at what was going on in the car audio world and realized there was at the time, this is the 80s, just a lot of a lot of mess. If nothing else yeah. in a car, every speaker is in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, and he did this thing back then. Uh, he called it the ten thousand dollar amplifier challenge. And his claim was that all these people who say that they'll take their amplifier car or home audio and that they can pick it out, they know what it sounds like, and one amp sounds better than another amp. And he claimed that a watt sounds like a watt and that you can't make an amp sound better than another one. And I'll, I'll tell you about his test first, and then I'd love to hear your reaction to, to this setup. So what he would do is he would, you know, you don't have to put any money up, but if you, if you won, he'd give you 10 grand. And, and so he would do a blind AB test. He would take your amplifier and an amplifier that he had. He used an audio precision to calibrate them. He would go through and use an RTA. And if one of the amps had, you know, a little bump in the frequency, because like tube amps sound good, they sound warm. Well, there's some frequency that you bump up to make it sound yeah. warm. He would go in, he'd flatline these things with the EQ. He would gain match them to with the audio precision and then play them AB testing. And the rule was, I forget what the numbers were, but if you've, if you've done some statistics, you can understand how the probabilities work. If it were yeah. just one trial, 50-50 chance of getting it wrong. All right, so you had to get it right like nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10. And, and the deal was he'd give you 10 grand. And if you wanted better odds, you could put a grand up yourself and he'd do like you know, a grand versus five grand. And but no one, no one ever got it, something right? Like that. No one ever got close. Most people couldn't get above 50-50. And so he claimed that he had evidence and a test that all amplifiers sound the same. And so here you are building amplifiers and I would <laughs> love to know your reaction to, to the assertion that all amplifiers sound the same. A, a, a watt sounds like a watt. 
Well, if the setup That's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not trying to put you on the I spot. Mean, no, just, if 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 anyone if you can have a question setup, if you have a setup where you know the two amps you're testing are gonna work on it and they're working within their their specs, mm -hmm. they're gonna mm -hmm. perform the same. But that's not indicative of real world where if you for instance um, one of the people that I'm close with, he's an, he's an integrator that sells my amps, but not many of them. Um, but he works with me. He was actually out here helping me set up my storm, storm audio for my theater. He has a pair of Pearl Listens that in, at 20 kilohertz, their, their impedance is basically zero. It's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I mean, it's literally the same as shorting out. And, and you talk about amps sounding the same. I get that, but he, he had some high end class a b amps over the years that have always overheat or trip or go into protection driving those speakers to the levels he wanted and they finally um when he reached out to me and was interested in, in kind of selling my amps he asked if i had one for him to try and that was our purify 7040 which is rated at two ohms for about 900 watts but it has almost 50 amps of current output into it and those okay. at the levels he's demanding those speakers have never tripped have never perfectly working so when i say people say a watt is a watt yes when it's working within its spec and when this when what it's driving is within its spec but the big difference here is if you're trying to drive a certain speaker and then you take one amp that obviously can't drive it one that can you're obviously going to hear a difference because one amp won't even be able to play it or you'll have distortion but when so if you level the playing field yeah you can get one one to one and i understand that and um, I've never argued against that. If, if you're playing, if both amps and even the speakers being used, if everything's playing within its specs and how it's rated, no, they'll work. But where you start getting like, okay, in the real world, this isn't how this actually works is you start taking, you take a chip maker amp, like you even brought up and you put it on um, some, you know, 80, 82 sensitivity Maggie's and you want to listen at, at on reasonably high levels that that amp's not going to like the watt to watt's going to give out pretty quick or the amp itself is just going to have an issue or you're going to have distortion so within its specs you can get two amps to if you have it set up so they're performing exactly the same yeah electricity and you and you also brought up another thing and if you eq the amps to get rid of any of their inherent differences so that's another part you have to bring up because not everyone at home, even if you run your your Odyssey EQ, that's necessarily not necessarily going to tame, you know, the distortion that a tube app might have that makes it sound warmer per se. So even if you if you take out even inherent characteristics of the amps and make them all equal and allow them to only play within their specs that they're guaranteed to work with. Yeah. Watt in, watt out. I understand that. So but then you get to the real world, you start adding all these variables. There's a lot more to it. Yeah, another couple of things to think about too is uh, everything he was testing in the 80s were all class A, B. Class D has changed a lot too, especially in their output stage. Now, I don't understand all of all of that, but I do know that the output stage of a class D amplifier makes a big difference on the final outcome of the amplifier. Um, and then you mentioned it too, Dylan. We're talking about noise floor as well that can also have a big difference yeah. on that as well, where I, I'm not sure... If that, you know, that's, that's a really interesting test. And I, I almost guarantee in car audio where there's like, I don't think very, most of the time, very good amplifiers in general in car audio. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong there. That's just my so, inherent belief. I don't even, I've been in car audio in years, but, but that brings me to my next question. Will we ever see purify hype X in car? Cause can't they work in car audio as so, they are? No, you would need, well, they're 120, so you'd need conversion for 12 volt for DC, okay. um, which itself is its own issue. I mean, that's that adds, but the price, I, I actually had someone interested for a good year kind of with the car audio um, side of things, asked me, hey, you know, there's some people I'd be interested in the car. Audio. Well, if you ever found a way to make these, like take a Hypex amp and make it, you know, but for that world, there's a lot of hurdles and price is one of the big ones because mm -hmm. you can go out and get, it won't obviously be the same if you measure them apples to apples and put them, you know, take a Hypex and take uh, a nice JVC or, 
and Alpine or JBL measurement wise without doing anything to them. If you just put them on an um, audio analyzer, like an AP, there's going to be a huge difference between them. But for the price and for what they're using it for, especially subwoofer amps for car audios, it's not, True. that's why I have to remind people too. And I have people, even for home audio, if someone comes to me and says, Hey, you know, what amp of yours would you recommend for me for a passive sub? I would tell them, unless you just have the money to spend, the benefits of what the Hypex and Purify bring are not going to make a difference for your sub because your sub is playing in a, in a frequency range where distortion almost doesn't matter to a point where that's why ice amps can give you a thousand Watts because, but maybe when you measure them, they, that thousand Watts might be at 5% distortion or even not the typical, you know, 0.1 or one we want to look at because in that frequency range, you're not going to hear it. So there's some hurdles there. It's basically saying, it's a great technology, but the price you'd have to pay to use it in car audio, not many people would be interested. Not enough for it to be a market, I think. All right. You know, I got to ask yeah, you an yeah. honest question. Go ahead. So on your website, you offer a bunch of different amplifiers, right? So let's yeah. let's let's go to your website. Let's look at these. Let's go back to the shop. All right. You have Hypex Encore, and you've already mentioned the difference between the NCX and the Purify, which are yes. right now the cream of the crop. Yes. Of as far as audio quality. And and I get that. Just because we can measure a difference doesn't necessarily mean we can hear a difference. Which one of these, out of all of these that you offer, do you feel is the best value typically? Um for the best value of someone saying for like hey, a I'm surround sound system. Yeah. Someone exactly, said, hey, okay. look, I want to yeah, if someone comes to me and says I'm putting together a, a 5.1 system, a 7.1. Um, sure. and it's for home theater, um, either the NC two, five, two. So like I said, if it's a five channel surround, I tell them the six channel NC two, five, two, or that's, that's if, a great if, price. If, if they're saying, uh, if then if someone says, well, I really want extra power for my fronts because, um, especially, especially for home theater, someone might want to run like for my home theater. I just did. I have my fronts. They're JBL cinemas. They don't need much power at all because they're hundred decibel. Uh, sensitivity, but um, my other theater, like my other setup, if you're, especially if you're crossing your fronts, maybe at 60 Hertz where your surrounds and at most, you don't need anything under 80 Hertz. Maybe even you might go up to 120 because they're not playing as well in your room, whatever. If someone comes to me and says, yeah, I like a little more power for my fronts. I would tell them a four channel NC252 um, and then the rest with NC or four channel NC502, sorry. And then everything okay. else filled in with 252s. Um, if they want that extra power up front. Now, some people will, will keep, if someone, if someone asks me my true opinion, you're like, well, what's the best amps period for my speakers? I would then tell them, well, if your budget allows a three channel purify for your fronts and then Easy. two five twos for everything else. But if you ask me one amp right off the bat, I'm building a five channel system for home theater. The best value would probably be the two five two. See, uh, and that's, that's exactly what I was looking at. I mean, you can get, the eight channel, for example, for fifteen ninety five, and I would even tell someone like, "Hey, look, if you have a five point one, and you're thinking later of adding Atmos, maybe just jump up to the to the eight channel if you want to right now, because yeah. it's it'd be cheaper to do that now than and, later." And a, well, and a caveat to that is, I do if someone thinks they might add on, I can for a little extra money pre wire or change the case size. So if they add on later, they can just drop a module in, plug and play. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah that's. Well, I'm glad I asked that question. See, to me, I, I like those 252s. Now, I, I run high efficiency speakers, right. so I don't need like the 500. But someone had asked a question earlier, and I thought it was a good question. He he basically yelled it at us. Why are class, teams always, class D amps always listed slash advertised at max watts? Like on your... I saw that, and I also yeah. want to address someone below it, I think, said um, something about 10% distortion. Um, yeah, I think they were talking about subwoofers typically. Oh, I, okay. I didn't know if they're talking about. Um, oh, well, maybe so not. Says amps are usually rated at 10% distortion level for max. Oh. So there's two. I want yeah, to address that also. It goes together. The max ratings for the Hypex and Purify I show is at 1%, not 10%. So I don't know. Other amps, it might be 10%, you know, on the market. Those are max output at 1%. Um, which is what it should be for a full range amplifier. Yes. And, and then where peak is an issue, 
continuous and peak with these, with the Hypex and the Purify, um, it's not set in stone. So it's it's thermal dependent on what the temperature is. And the peak rating actually, so if you go to something like the Purify that uses the Hypex power supply, that peak rating of like 425 watts at four ohms, that's actually over a period of 10 seconds. So so it's kind of, it's not peak like you might think of another amplifier where like, oh, one second, that's what it can hit and then it has to back down. That can do that for 10 seconds before, and that's without any cooling. That's just with the module, the power supply section when Hypex test that power supply section sitting on a plate like what you see here like a base with no extra cooling let's say no it can do that 425 for 10 seconds before it has to start backing down thermally and then the continuous for something like that is around 200 watts continuous without any extra cooling but why I say it's why it's hard to give you an exact rating is because in normal normal usage at home you're not going to be hitting max output continuously for any content you're playing unless you're doing a sine wave even if you play a movie at reference you'll hit max for scenes and it'll back down for even a couple of seconds and you'll hit like it's it's ups and downs so that peak rating is actually realistically something you can keep hitting over and over for normal content that's why yeah, i was i'm not oh, trying to be okay, misleading i just try and tell people that that it's not a set in stone thing the way these are engineered that they can keep hitting those peaks pretty consistently so i was going to say that too so one of the things that i think a lot of people don't realize and me and justin talk about this all the time is that people don't realize how little watts they're actually using yeah. <laughs> like they they think oh my amplifier is 150 watts so i'm using 150 watts no you're probably not you're probably not in anywhere near the 150 it's usually, most of the time using it's, music as an example it's usually about one eighth so if, if this if you're Whatever the you're set at for a sine tone, if you're playing continuous music, the amplitude of that is about of what you're actually hitting for you know kind of a continuous output is about one eight. So if you're if you're thinking you know I need I'm, I have a 300 watt amp and I'm playing music pretty loud, you're probably only using um, like I said about uh, God I'm bad I'm bad with math at the moment uh, probably about 20 25 watts continuous even at the at a loud level. Um, but then you have those dynamics that hit. So like yes. when you're watching a movie, for example, in those scenes that come up and like frighten you and you hear yes. those real pitch noise or bass, especially bass, especially is where you use a lot of power output where it comes at you. That's when you want those peak numbers. Yes. And what Dylan's saying, or at least what I understand you to be saying is that a lot of amplifiers will hit that peak, but they'll hit it like that. And then they'll shut it off. De so if depending you on their, yeah, depending on how it's, and especially class AB that that get hot and stay hot because it's hard sure. for them. For how hot they get, it's hard to displace all the heat. They're, depending on how well it's built, um, a lot of them are usually what I've seen is like a one to three second rating. Where mm -hmm. So if you have a really, really loud, continuous peak scene that's maybe four or five seconds, um, there's the potential that, and someone brought up the, the dynamic transients, the transient peaks that uh, not so well engineered amp, that peak rating you're seeing is actually probably the best you're gonna get for maybe a second or two and then it's gonna fall off. Whereas these, they're, they're rated, again, without any extra cooling and extra help to maintain those peaks for at least 10 seconds based on the Hypex ratings. All right. See, that's really. So I'm, I was going to bring yeah. that up. I was looking at your specifications, and I, you know, I, I don't know how it is in the hi-fi home audio world and kind of the audio file world that you operate in, but over in this car audio world, um, and Nick, you can put my screen up if you want to, real quick. We have this no. massive problem with. Um, uh, this is uh, this is one of my websites. This is maxpoweraudio.com. Uh, I'm trying to sell T-shirts making fun of people who make up uh, amplifier ratings. Uh, at maxpoweraudio.com, we put the fiction in specification. I've sold a ton of shirts. Let me tell you, um, uh, exactly zero at this point. So I, maybe, <laughs> some, maybe, I can drive, maybe I can drive some more traffic to it. But um, but we have this problem in the car audio world where companies will make amplifiers and smack a big number on them. They'll say, here's our peak power. Here's our max power. Yeah. And sometimes it's a number based on reality where it's twice the RMS power. 
and some of these brands, that number is just a complete work of fiction. There's, it's not related yeah, to anything near reality. Um, no, maybe and, like, maybe like one quick pulse of a sine wave, like not even a second. They, if lightning they strikes it. it. I, I, when lightning strikes, yeah. right. So when lightning strikes is the other, um, we make max oh, power when lightning strikes. Oh, you have one of those Oh, yeah, wow. Max oh, that's Power awesome. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other one, uh, the numbers don't lie, but we do. Um, <laughs> um, but but they're these these made up numbers and, yeah. and they'll oftentimes use peak. I've got an amp that I'm getting ready to do an amp dyno on that uses a, a peak number and I'm looking at the amp and it's like this thing weighs less than my computer mouse. It's not going to do 10 watts probably. And we have to do a better job of understanding power ratings and communicating those to customers and, and showing which amplifiers just won't do it. So in our little world, we call what you're talking about dynamic range is what we would call it. And, um, and we got this problem with people just making up numbers. And so what we've done is we've created this environment where there's a few people on YouTube that have the test equipment and test a lot of amplifiers in the car audio world, a good amp is an amp that puts out more than its RMS power into one of these amp resistive loads. No, 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 that's, that's not right. That's not right. A good amp is what puts out what it states it's supposed to put out in that range. Because we we talked about, I talked about that with, you're talking about Big D. I talked about with Big D and he said, look, I don't want an amplifier that puts out five times more power than what it says. I want it oh, to just me either. do what it says. Yeah. It, it, so I, I want to do what it says yeah. it's going to do within a reasonable right. margin of error. But right, we've got this working. environment yeah. where a good amp is an amp where, uh, you know, you and I could all buy the same amp from China, put our brand name on it and sell it. And I could I could say it does a thousand watts and you could say it does 800 and then it does 900. And you're the good guy for selling the amp that does more than it's rated. And I'm the bad guy for ripping people off. And I bring <laughs> that up because I had a question about your product. You mentioned almost from the start, you talked about measurement. So in the small little world I live in, measurement is just what's the RMS power going into a resistor? What's it going to see on the amp dyno? And so when you say, hey, the measurement, right? My amps measure as good as amplifiers that are you know, four or five times the price. What are you measuring and how are you measuring it? So I'm not good with sharing um, the screen. If you want to, I mean, if Nick wanted to even pull up. Yeah, um, Amir stuff. Yeah, but what's being measured and what we measure, um, signal to noise ratio, crosstalk, um, IMD for kind of another distortion, the what is, peak what that power, mean? IMD, the uh, intermodulation distortion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, peak power. So we do, so like Amir will measure it. And I'll even measure it. Um, and one of the people that is a collaborator with me with some of the stuff we do. So you can get peak power right off the bat, um, but then like a mirror will will show you the power at Hypex and Purify will give you one percent distortion power. Okay. But then like a mirror's measurements, he'll actually do it what he calls at the knee to show you here's the the power the max power you're getting be, when distortion is usually it's about 0.1 percent before distortion starts rising exponentially. Mm -hmm. So it's not just hey here's power and how it measures. Um, it all kind of comes together. Um, and, and, and I weird... remind people, so he he has this number, and this came up in one of my other podcasts I was on, um, that if if you just measured and did like what some people might go to Amir's website and see, he does this SNAD rating of how of your basically um, harmonic distortion versus noise and kind of puts in a SNAD. And people might look at that and say, all right, perfect. This is all I need to know about an amplifier. And I've always tried <laughs> to remind people, this is a good starting point. If you look at this graph, all I would tell you is, it gives you an idea of anything really orange or below is showing that there's some sort of dis there's something inherently wrong with the amp because it's distorting even um, for every reason it's distorting pretty bad. It's got a bad. Wait, are you are you saying that Klipsch might have a bad amplifier out there and Yamaha and now uh, so <laughs> yeah. I just um, yeah and that's where we'll, you start we'll getting that. and that's where it comes into I it kind of bridges into. Um, when people talk about, well, if my, if I have a good receiver that it's rate, like if you take, you can take like an Anthem receiver and it might actually meet, you know, when all five channels are driven, it might put out good power at like a hundred Watts. But then when you actually measure it, you can start to see, all right, well, that's actually at a pretty high distort. Like there might be some trade off. So that's its own, own whole discussion of why separates a good separate can still have a, 
Um, even if power is the same output, there's still positives to be gained. But as you can see here, no, we don't just, it's not just one measurement of, um, hey, here's my absolute peak. That's all I'm going to show you. Everything is, first of all, even before Amir does his measurements, one thing he's able to confirm, not just with my amps, but over the years, what Hypex and Purify put in their data sheets are pretty spot on and honest. They've never really stretched the truth. They've never hidden anything. So he's always been able to show that, keep them honest. Like, look, guys, I'm basically verifying that what their reference design and what they put in their data sheets is being replicated by the person assembling it and also showing that it's not being um, from the bat, you know, Hypex isn't jacking up numbers. So all that data that, Hy that Amir shows is actually are usually already available from Hypex or Purify as a manufacturer because, again, they're not, there's nothing to hide with these. It's like, you, I know what you're getting at. You know, you could be someone who says, oh, I did one quick measurement and yeah, we did, we hit 300 watts on this distortion curve and not tell you what the distortion was or not tell you how quick or at what, um, was it one kilohertz? Was it 20 kilohertz? Like, right. the, you know, the measurements and um, that Amir does and that even Hypex themselves and Purify, again, that Amir has kind of validated, they cover a wide range to try and, because I think they knew and I, I know with the car audio, that's kind of been one thing that's followed Class D around in the hi-fi world, the home audio world, is that people have this image of car audio still, of those people that would say, oh, you're telling me this Hypex amp does 300 watts? I've heard that in car audio. I bet it's like 50 max. So right. these companies like Hypex and Purify, I think, knew they had to get ahead of that and be on it. Like, look, here's all this data dump showing that, no, these are two separate things. We're, we're not that. So one of the things that we've learned both in car audio and home audio is that in order to get all of the amplification that you're you're saying on your spec sheet, you have to have the right voltage output on your uh, on, on whatever your output is. Now, yes. typically, if you get like a high end pre out, it's going to have a balanced output. However, if you run something like the Denon X3800 or you're running something like the Onkyo. All those have Dirac. So, you know, I'm, I'm naming the ones with Dirac. Some of those actually have RCA pre-outs. And yeah. so people get concerned when they go RCA to, you know, to your balanced input. They have two questions. One, how do I run it properly? And two, will I get the max power that you're saying on there? Or am I going to lose a lot of power? And so what, what voltage output should they be looking at on their RCAs? So a good... A good RCA, a good receiver, not a processor, because if a processor is doing anything under two volts, even on RCA, it's it shouldn't be a processor because at that price range, um, it should be able to do better. But a good receiver, um, right. when you measure it, usually can hit at least two volts for a max. Um, like the Denons, I believe, are around 1.6 continuous, but they can hit two volts before any major distortion. The lowest I've seen with a receiver, I believe, is some of the Yamahas that are like 1.2 volts continuous. And then maybe you can stretch it and get a two volts out of it before there's any distortion. The The big part of it is um, each module is a little different. So like the NC252, why that's also one of the ones I recommend if someone's building a 5.1 type setup that has a receiver, it only needs 1.6 volts, about 1.7 yeah. volts. To drive to full power. That, that's all it needs. The that's NC, good. The NC502, for instance, though, needs about 2.3 volts um, to drive to full power. The Pier 5, we made our own gain stage, and we made it so the high gain stage of ours needs 2 volts. Again, that's kind of the trade-off there is we didn't, with something like the Pier 5, we didn't want to go lower in the gain stage because that does bring in a little more distortion. Um, but that's why we also offer like a really a low gain on ours, where if you have a, up to six volts, you can get a little better distortion out of it if you can drive it that hard. Um, so A, connecting from a receiver that has RCA out to ours, all you need is an RCA to XLR cable, not an adapter. I have to remind people of this. Do not use adapters. Those actually will introduce noise and can drop the signal by... Um, a good amount can actually add uh, attenuation to it. So an RCA to XLR cable. Going RCA to XLR, there's no there's no pertinent consideration for wiring. You're not going to hurt it if it's wired wrong. The where that comes in is there's some processors like if you get processors XLR out 
and your amp is um, RCA in. If you go XLR from the source to RCA to the amplifier, then it has to be wired properly because you can actually do damage. But going from RCA out of a receiver to XLR in of a uh, amp like ours, you just need an RCA to XLR cable. 99 or about 95% of the time, any cable will work. If you get one that's not wired correctly, you'll know right away because it'll introduce a little bit of noise or hum. Um, then you would just have to uh, get a different one. I usually recommend on like Amazon, World's Best um, sells them. They're wired correctly. And I and I can provide my customers if they were asked the diagram because like Blue Jeans Cable will make you one that's wired exactly right. Um, so that's all you need to connect them. The second question is what happens if you don't have enough pre-out on that RCA? So take, for example, um, let's say the Purify at high gain, We you need two volts to drive it. Um, to max power to about 400 watts into four ohms. Well, if you give it one volt, um, half as much, so that's three decibels down because you're having three decibels doubling. So basically it's saying, even if you only give it one volt on the pre-out, all you're losing in max headroom is about three decibels of max headroom. So in the grand scheme of things, you're not, it's not like you're losing half. I mean, technically you're losing half yeah. the power, but it's, but in the scheme of actually, what can it still do? It relates to about three decibels. So if you were trying to, and again, then this comes back into, well, people will think that three decibels is a lot, but then that's when they're trying to use these calculators to say, well, I'm playing at reference 105 decibels and not figuring that as peaks. Because I've seen some people do the calculators and think the 105 decibels needs to be continuous instead <laughs> of peaks when you're doing home theater. Again, Ouch. that's its own thing. Because if you said 105 decibels continuous, your ears are going to give out before anything else. Um, so that all feeds into people hear that and then think, oh, well, I'm getting half the worst case. If you only do one volt out, I'm only getting 200 watts from this Purify. That seems, you know, terrible. Oh, no, it's well, no, that's only three decibels and three decibels. Really, the only time that's going to affect you is when you're hitting those peak numbers during those. Right. Dynamics. And, and if you're hitting peaks in your theater and you think your immersion is going to be affected because you're only getting 102 decibel peaks instead of 105. No. Honestly, <laughs> that's it. Again, shouldn't make that big of a difference. No, and I have my theater set up. I just finished it. Like I love ref. I love clean sound, so I want to hit reference, treated it properly. But like even at reference level for a perfect playback track, it's not that it hurts my ears, but it's like I I wouldn't feel like I'm missing out if someone asked me to turn it down a few decibels. Like it's still really great. That's a great, that's a great explanation. I, I appreciate that. Now there's one other question I think we should ask because we're running out of time. And that is you had mentioned on youth Man's channel uh, just a few weeks ago that you've got a new product coming out. You want to tell us about the new product, when it might come out and the cool things you got going on with that. Yeah. So people that um, have been following um, the new product we have coming out and it'll probably be, I'll give you the date. Well, it's not a set date, but we're shooting for the first quarter of 2024 because we don't want to rush it um sure. i never want to rush my products um but it's a two-channel integrator um and it's starting off as your basic two-channel integrator it'll be two rca in two xlr in and then two channel out um we'll also have a low pass um uh rca out and a line level rca out from the start nice. with a remote can um, i ask you a question about that low pass real quick yeah basically it's a subwoofer out yeah um is that going to, is the volume going to go up with the volume control of the subwoofer out, or is that going to be independent? Um, the volume of the subwoofer out. So you can, oh, you so, can wire that one of two ways. One, it can either be static, right? And it can stay, you have to change the volume on your subwoofer yourself. No, no, no. It would change or, with, if your volume is changing, it's go with it. So the idea is you're listening to 2.1 setup. You want to control the volume like it'd be a receiver. No, exactly. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what I was asking. Okay, yeah, great. No, yeah. So great. yeah, no, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and that's kind of the base. So it'll have, um, it's, it's a base integrated at that point. So you'd still need a source to feed it like a iPhone or a DAC, something to feed it, but it's doing the amplification and volume control. And like I said, supple for hookup. But the real great thing is, is that even if you buy day one, the integrated, we're designing the, the initial, the baseboard that goes into it to accept a, uh, an add on. So an expansion board that will be user replaceable. Everything I try and do, I allow, if a user wants to, they can add it in. If they 
I, and I don't force them. So like, even if you have an issue with one of my amps, it's not that I'm forcing you to do it, fix it on your own. I've always made it. So if someone says they are, if you've done computer work before, whatever, I always try to make it easy. Hey, I'll send you the parts, tell you how to do it. It's really simple. Never have to solder, but that'd be the idea. So with our integrated, it'd be that at a later date, we're going to release a, an expansion module that we're hoping we're aiming to have Dirac available for it. So then you could um, do room EQ on your two channel, um, have an HDMI in, with, oh, yeah. That's with e arc. So the idea there is you could, if you know, as I explained when we did our pre show thing, that's would be tailored to people that have they want something better than a sound bar, but they don't want a full stair, surround setup for like maybe watching football games casually. Well, then you can pass the audio from your TV to this power two speakers and a sub, you're good to go. Um, and then, uh, can I ask a quick question about yes. Dirac? Yes. Um, there's so many different versions of Dirac. Which which version are you looking so, at? And we're confirming this. The person that helps me with this, just so people know, it's not like I'm... I know there's been some companies in the past that have kind of strayed into new territories. I was burned by one where I used to lo- thought their processor was great and then um, found out that they just didn't have what was needed to grow it and it kind of sucked. Um, mm. there's been companies that have been spurred in the past by like trying to go out of their comfort zone knowingly. And I just want to give it the person that's helping me with this. Um, he's always asked to keep his name out of any, he's worked with a lot of companies. So he likes to keep his name out of it and he won't even, he can't even tell me specifically, but like he's worked with MDS Meridian digital solutions, like the HDMI boards and with one of the higher, higher, highest end processors on the market. So he knows what he's doing. But him and I have talked and he wants to confirm, but with his work um, with Dirac, I, we believe, and we have to double check, that's why I'm not promising anything. But the way Dirac is, is it's kind of every, as long as you have the one chip, the one DSP, the one right board, the add-ons are just dependent on what the customer wants to pay. Yeah, so they can purchase up exactly. to- Exactly, so with Dirac, the, we, we, it might be, for instance, like $200 to add the board to my integrated, but we wouldn't charge the customer $500 for add-ons. They would, through Dirac, would say, all right, I want to... And a lot of them do that now. Like if you have a, a monoprice processor, well, then you would go on Dirac and you'd say, I want to buy the base level Dirac. I want to buy the base management. Like you, the customer yeah. would decide. Actually, Denon is doing, and they've actually released it in stages. So the first thing they released was, okay, mm-hmm. I think it's their X800 series. So the 3800, yeah. 4800, 6800, whatever those were. They said, all right, you can buy Dirac Limited, which just does room correction, basically, in the, the major problem areas, right? The, the low-end base to 500 hertz, basically. Then you could purchase Dirac Full. And then sometime early next year, they're going to let you do the base control. And yes. supposedly, who knows? Supposedly, they're working on the um, art. art. Yeah. yeah. And, and what because the chip can handle it, so it's a matter yes. of whether they can integrate it or not. And so then maybe you'll be able to get art with those as well, but there's no promise of that because Storm Audio had that, they, they, like no one else could buy it until Storm was it this month, right? Was allowed to, um, they had a 10 month basically free, like they were the only ones allowed to have art for 10 months, and just now it's kind of letting up where I saw like Monoprice is supposed to have a a beta driver out to try and start getting, um, which art I, I'm actually not using it on my store. I'm not to get in a, it. It requires a lot of time on your user's part. Cause you, there's a lot of dialing in to get it right. Mm. Um, and I just want to enjoy my theater. I have it dialed in pretty good anyways. Um, but no, that's the thing with Dirac is, is as the component, you're not paying extra for something you might not use. It's more, it's kind of a double-edged sword because if you, if I said, if Dirac made it so that the licensing fee was like maybe like Dolby where the manufacturer paid the licensing fee, then they could just spread it out, you know, an extra hundred dollars on each unit. Everyone pays, even if you might not use it, but with Dirac, right. it's saying, all right, if no one wants to use Dirac with this upgrade module, but they want the HDMI in at least of the module, cause it's an all in one, then they just won't pay the extra money to, to, to Dirac to use it. But then if they Can do I, want to use it, they themselves would upgrade it how they want. Look, I, I know this is kind of away from the amplifier itself, but I just want to say I actually really appreciate that model because the amount that it costs to add the different person, you know, parts of yeah. the rack onto onto the amplifier 
would drive the amplifier price out to the price where people wouldn't be paying for exactly. it. Exactly. Yep. And so it's kind of nice that people that want to spend 1500 1300 exactly. on an amplifier can get their surround sound receiver. And then as they decide to upgrade, they can. Right. They can upgrade that one as they go, which no, I, I, I like that. Yeah, no, I really like how they do it because it and it is friendly. It makes it very friendly to incorporate. It makes it kind of open feeling where I love Dolby, but like that's why Dolby Visions had its own adopting it. It's kind of its own issue because you need to pay certain licensing fee just to kind of won't get into that. But it, it does keep like I could never offer Dolby Vision type decoding on a product of mine because that'd be a price that. Not that I ever would get into the processing side of video, but yeah. No, Dirac is, that's why, again, at first it never crossed my mind, but the more I talked to the integrator I work with who has experience, he reminded me, he said, oh no, since the customer can decide what they want to buy, if they want to buy it, you're just paying for the board. That's it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, to me, like, that's fantastic because all you're doing is you're adding the ability for them to add that later if they want to. Exactly. Yeah. And that's kind of how I've always liked to... Even though my amps may seem basic, like I said, the, one of the reasons I try and make them even user um, fixable or replaceable is it also makes it easy to upgrade. If, for instance, Hypex in a year or two came out with a new version of the MP series modules, if there's any way where I can make it so someone wants to upgrade and all it is is I send an extra you know, plug and play cable to them, I want to keep it that way. So an integrated like this, the idea is, if you buy that expansion card, you can install it yourself if you want, or I could do it if you need to send it back. But it's like, it'll have everything on it, but not at a price point where you paid for everything that you might not use type of thing. All right. There's a really good question that someone had. Well, first of all, do you have, is there anything else you want to say about that amplifier? Because I, I love I love the idea of that amplifier. I think it sounds great. No, I, I just, um, like I said, we're, we're not rushing it, but we have, we, um, we have, I mean, it's, I have a, and one here, um, basically we have all the fine details worked out. It, a lot of it was kind of getting, uh, you know, the right plexiglass to cover the front, getting things tooled, getting things set up. So now it's just kind of dialing in the firmware. Um, but no, it's, I think people will be excited about it. And like I said, even it, I won't promise at all a date range for the add-on module, but I, like I said, I will say no one will be left in the dirt where we're, we're not going to release the final version of our base integrated until we know what we want to offer on the add-on module to know that our base integrated module, like the one you buy from day one, will 100% accept what we want to add on later. Because I know yeah, that's, no, that's some people in the past with certain equipment that, you know, initially it's promised, oh, this will be add-on. And then it's like, well, actually, we didn't put the right chip exactly. in. So That's no. every single video game nowadays, right? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, we're not charging yeah. you for DLC to make the game better. <laughs> Right. Like, I swear. I, by the way, this DLC really is just to make the game run properly. Oh, like you have say, to. Oh, you're going to pay $20 just for, you know, um, DLSS or whatever. Like, really? Like, what? Yeah. It's like, all right. So, um, someone asked this question. And honestly, I don't know the answer to this. Not that I think it matters because I feel like if you buy a really good amplifier, you should have that for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, unless you really, really, really want to upgrade again. I don't know. I don't, I don't change out my amplifiers a lot. Like, I mean, heck you can still find a lot of really nice used AB. Now you might have to change out some capacitors or whatnot, but he said, I'm curious about what's the resale value of Buckeye amps. I so, no um, I've actually, like I said, I'm always on ABS and ASR forums, not just as an owner. I'm always like, even though I'm in the audio business, I'm still an audio enthusiast. So I love to go on the forums and just learn. And from what I've seen, when like, for instance, a three channel purify popped up on the AVS a um, couple, like maybe a month or two ago, the person that bought it from me new for $14.50, sold it for $12.75. Wow. Um, that was so, good. dang. That, yeah. Well, and and it's because to me, it's because there's, there's no, I, don't, I guess one thing is there's no wear and tear since our cases are just the way we are. It's not like you have a, piece of clack, uh, cracked plexiglass or, you know, the lettering is starting to fade here. Like it's just, it, what it does is what it does and it works. What Dylan's trying to tell you is they don't go on sale. So, um, so and I'll, I'll say that real quick. I had a sale in the spring and people might've missed it that even after the sale, I actually, which is again, I'm, 
not, I guess, common and maybe um, not to applaud myself, but I lowered all my prices across the board after that sale um, just to have low prices kind of continuously going forward. So I inherently make my prices low where sales aren't as much of a viable option for me because they're just low mm -hmm. to begin with. Well, and, and they're already a great value. So, you know, you, you shouldn't have to lower your prices. Um, someone did ask this question. What what amp would you recommend for a tri-amp two-channel? So, so if you're doing, I think they're asking if they have a two-channel like, setup and they want to tri-amp each speaker. That's what um, I'm, that's what, that's how I'm reading it. Like they have, like they're, they're powering their, their highs, their mids and their lows. Separately. Yeah. So the the one actually someone who i'm working with right now is kind of going through this it kind of depends especially on your lows so this person actually the lows he's using to drive his speakers can dip down to um 1.9 ohms for the woofer which and th wow. that's around 30 hertz and so that's that's very demanding um so i actually recommend him the 7040s those version twos which i talked about way earlier how they're the ones that were running my the friend the integrated speakers that everything else had tripped on uh at really low ohms um so for him i recommend the 7040s for the woofers and then um then for mids and highs you could just do like a four channel 252 to run mids and highs because those woofers is what needs most of the power anyways right yeah so there you go there's your answer um someone had asked one more question that i I don't know if you know the answer to this or if you've done this, but he said, this is AJC. He's been a long time watcher. He said, could you wa ask him his opinion on the Purify versus the NCX 500 with no buffer? So without uh, a ACR buffer did stage. not yeah. test the Purify without the buffer stage. Yeah, so he, Amir, I guess he does. Amir tested the NCX 500 two ways. Initially, it was without any buffer stage, which required, I think it was a... 11 or 12 volts to drive again that's why you need a buffer stage for most people um and that had the 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 incredible um sit and rating of i believe it was like 120 118 i don't have it in front of me like one of the best ever but again that's without any gain stage once you had a gain stage you are adding some distortion the idea is then to build a gain stage to have minimal distortion added um, and then he he measured it again with the low gain stage, which was like it needed um, seven or six volts to drive, which is more, you know, kind of in the realm of realistic for some people. Um, and that's when it was down to like 114, 115 for the Synad versus the Purify, which when he measured it was with a gain stage at low, which is around the same, like 110, 111. Um, I've never measured without the gain stage. But to me, again, you're splitting hairs there. When when you when you when someone says, "I want to run, I want the absolute best performance," I'm gonna and you can supply 12 volts. Yeah, I can build the NCX without the gain stage if you can supply it. But that difference between let's say 124 decibels of uh, when you're looking at total har harmonic distortion versus noise, 124 decibels of that versus 116, we're still well above the threshold of human hearing. You. People like to say about 100 decibels for golden ears is where any distortion above 100 decibels, you can't really hear when it's playing and you and even if you're a critical listener. So if you take that as a cutoff, 116 versus 120, 124, 126 is nothing. Again, that's why I say we're at, we're at the stage of these Class D now. They're just kind of making a joke of it to show, look how high, not saying they're, it's not relevant because to me, proving your technology can do it is is in and of itself, something kind of nice to have, but their measurements are showing they're at levels where it's just to show it now that they can do it, that their technology works. So it's kind of funny because in video, we do the same thing, right? Like when we measure television, we measure the Delta air and the Delta air, yeah. anything under three yeah. people, humans can't, can't decipher that. Most people can't. I mean, there might be someone with golden eyes, but most people cannot notice it. And I see some people reviewing it and they're like, wow, this one gets a Delta air of 1.8. And this one's a Delta air of 2.8. So this one's, I'm like, really? Like, are you sure that's better? Because we're talking about a difference of people can't view. So like the truth of the matter is both of them are great. Who cares? Right. Like, just And that's why I know. say, that's why when people like the Pier 5, Pier 5 versus NCX 500, where there's maybe a four or five decibel difference between them with their measurements, they're 
practically the same. The only thing like, and you bring up like uh, video calibration, then the, the only reason that's relevant to me is if the discussion goes in, well, who's implementing it better? Even if you can't, that's where I'm okay discussing sure. the technology. If you stop, if, if once we agree on the point of like, all right, both these are performing at a level that the distortion is inaudible, then we can have a fun discussion on, well, this one's actually into in implementing a, you know, the back end stage or this stage or that stage of technology a little better because look at its measurements. But again, that has to be done in the context of saying, well, that's not doesn't make it better than the other one in terms of real world usage. Yeah, it, like, even on even on even video, on TVs, yeah. I wish we could do it. I wish we could, you know, Sony and Samsung fanboys or people could get together and say both of our TVs are phenomenal. We can barely tell a difference. But I like that Samsung in this regard was able to implement this technology better without saying, well, that makes it better. Right. Because again, we're at levels that you can't tell the difference. Uh, I agree. Um, and not to not to mention, you know, I've been having this discussion. I recently reviewed a an ultra short throw projector. And the problem with ultra short throw projectors is they're triple laser projectors. And the uh, amount of equipment that you need to be able to properly calibrate one is over 13 grand, you know, yeah. and that's like the minimum. That's like the minimum is 13, 15 grand. And people want to get in this discussion. Well, this one, I can calibrate this one better. And I'm like, yeah, but how many people are going to pay 15 grand? to get the calibration equipment to calibrate it versus this one. Like to a certain degree, we have to look at it and say, do I like the look of it? You know? And, and I, I hate to say that, but if you, if you can't like an amplifier is a little bit different because an amplifier, we can look at it and say, okay, this is the finished product. This is what you're getting. You're probably not going to be doing much to it. Shouldn't need to DSP it. You might need to DSP your speakers, but not, yeah, not yeah. the amplifier. Yeah. So, you know, but on a TV to a certain degree, you get to the point where unless the Delta errors are just, unbelievable horrible then then that's a different story i'm at least glad with tvs that the there's more adopting of at least like a good standard or cinema mode because i hated it when they when like i had a lg plasma back in 2007 and it only had three modes it had dynamic standard and movie and like i had to use standard because movie sucked but i was <laughs> one of those people where i'd go over like to people's houses and they got better tvs and they're stuck in these dynamic modes. They're like, I hate watching football when the grass is neon. So at least we're at the <laughs> point where, like, I, like I get what you're saying. Out of the box, at least TVs are doing something that's acceptable and great for a majority of people. And that's right. kind of, um, but that's again, that's TVs. I'm glad you brought it up because, like, the amps. Another thing I bring up is people ask me another question. I get a lot. Not I don't know how much time we have, but another question I get a lot is, well, what do your amps do to the sound? The Hypex and Pier 5, if you look at their measurements, are flat across the frequency. 20 to 20 flat. They don't do anything to the sound. If there's well, any what? DSP I'm or sorry. anything that needs to be done, it's either because the source is doing something or the speakers are playing in a certain way. But that amp right there is whatever is being passed to it, it's amplifying. It's not changing it to color or change the sound. Yeah, I, I get in trouble a lot because I review amplifiers and when I review amplifiers, people said, well, you didn't tell me how it sounded. And I'm like, that's because I don't think it should sound like anything. No. Like if it sounds like something, then I'll tell you. And then you should be worried. If an amp <laughs> has a sound to it, it's because there's distortion and tube amps introduce. That's why some people will even ask me, well, will you put a uh, change the OP amp, the buffer? Like, could you add a tube amp buffer? I said, no, because that completely changes the idea of what these Hypex and Purify amps are trying to do, which is just pass the sound along without changing it. It's I'm just, so glad you just, said that. You just amplify and pass So it. glad you said that. That's that's yeah. what an amplifier is supposed to do. Yep. It's, and, I, I, you know, again, I threw a really hard question at you earlier, but I'll go back to that test. In that test, those two amplifiers were set up with, nearly the same thd neither one of them anywhere near outside their operating range and then amp is not supposed to change the sound it's supposed to amplify the sound um yeah. i'll, I'll give right. you an example of this a couple of weeks ago maybe been last week kicker on their live stream busted out an audio precision and were testing random amps now they had the amp cover with a towel i don't know what brand it was but there's a car <laughs> audio amp they tested you'll get a kick out of this dylan it didn't put out any power until it hit about eight watts Oh, wow. Because the noise yeah. floor was so darn high that yeah, they wanted yeah. it putting out at least eight watts. And the argument they were making was 
that they make good quality amplifiers. And when you bust out an audio precision and show people the data and show people what it can do, that's a whole different game than just measuring the power. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's too uh, expensive. I, 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 I can't believe I didn't bring the, another freak one that Mir does. He shows it right here. Frequency response. And that's an easy way to tell if an amp is doing what it should versus was it what it shouldn't. Now people will bring up like, on that 20 hertz, you see a roll off towards 10. We have to look at the scale. We're not even at 0.6 decibels. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. like if you okay. measure an amp and you see, you know, a two or three decibel roll off anywhere or a dip, that's not what it should be. Do like it. If you're designing an amp to do that, I understand if you market it that way, but realistically, an amp should never change the sound. Period. It just should. So I, I want to mention this too, because one of the things I found really interesting about this, this particular graph is that a lot of class D amplifiers, we had mentioned the difference before in some of the class D, like the uh, crowns and the uh, yeah. Behringers and things of that nature. Um, I know crown XLS, for example, if I'm not, and they may have changed it, but they used to have a non-defeatable 30 Hertz roll off or 30 yeah. Hertz. You just, you know, you started rolling off and you, you know, a lot of people want to use this for subwoofers. I was like, go to the XTI that doesn't have that. But, um, you know, people don't want to spend the XTI money, which I get that too. But um, this, like, there's no low end roll off at all. I mean, that's really impressive. No, and yeah, like I said, you got to look at the scale. No, those. Uh, well, for yeah, instance, there's no I'll, I'll like give no people an example of real world usage. Rhythmic subs uses Hypex plate amplifiers, like their FV18, which I have. They use Hypex plate amplifiers, and those subs will play, and you can measure them they'll play clean down to 10 Hertz easily. So when people bring up, Oh, well, you know, you're, I hear class D is only good to 20 Hertz. I can show you right now. There's a, there's a known sub woofer maker that's accepted in the community whose subs can get down to 10 Hertz easily. So no, it's not, it's, it's, is possible. I don't know where this comes from. Well here, and here's exactly what we're talking about. Here's the XLS, right. Yeah. That I was talking about earlier. Here's the XLS and look at it. Like there's a, I mean, you know, it's not a huge drop, but I mean, you're down over one and a half and, decibels by. And that's hertz. in a range where you need all the power you can get. I mean, Ex exactly. Yeah. Like you're you're losing, you're losing where you where you want that that room gain and that boost. And so, you know, I, I'm looking at that, and I didn't notice that at first until I looked at yours. And I want to look at yours again, just show people this because this is a this is impressive. Now, this is the 502, um, but you take a look at it. There's the, um, was that like point one. Oh, yeah, that's one point two. Yeah, maybe point two. Yeah, I mean, I think, and that's yeah, that's it. I that's, think it's point one. Yeah, like right at ten hertz. <laughs> yeah, and that's at ten hertz, like nothing. Yeah, like we saw that other one; it was starting to roll off by fifty hertz. And, and um, the five hundred two is actually the version used on the plate amps that uh, Rhythmic Audio uses for their sub. So again, these are capable. <laughs> um, in fact, I mean, that's why his subs when he builds them. They have a subsonic filter that you can turn on or off because if you leave it off and you play something like the intro to Edge of Tomorrow or uh, yeah Edge of Tomorrow, um, oh, yeah, that can Almost ruin your that. like that that will play the content under ten hertz. So again, when people bring up this misconception, that's that's also why they're still battling because people might have seen the crown data or how things used to be or how things were measured before these amps came out and they kind of carry it over saying. Oh, I remember, you know, 10 years ago, Class D, I remember amps of like those would have, you know, would roll off at 30 hertz because they saw a graph like that. Well, that's apples to oranges. We're in something different now. Yeah, no, but I, I love seeing that there's no roll off. Now it makes me want to get like, uh, they don't they don't sell anything more powerful than the 500. Do they, or you don't, I'm, I should say. For, for hype. Well, so they do. I don't build on them because again, then right. for subwoofer usage, it's a lot of money, but like they have a, uh, Hypex has a 2000 watt, the, um, 2k it's a, but each one is come basically you build them in mono configurations, but the cost to build one of those and then use it for a sub amp, the gains you get with the harmonic distortion, and everything are lost for an amp for a sub. And the price point of that is just not worth it. So just out of curiosity sake, what, what prices are we talking? Do you think like just uh, just throw out an estimation? I mean, if I know you're you a module like that. Yeah. 
Oh, um, I've never priced it how what I could offer it as, but I believe a mono Hypex, like the NC 2K or the NC 1200, I'm thinking people probably sell those at least 1200, 1300 minimum for a mono. But minimum. if you did it, but if you did a 2K, if, if it was 12 or 1300, I, I you know, we're just, I don't, again, I, my, yeah, we're just my the Purify 7040 okay. that I have is 950 for a mono, and that's on the low end compared to other competitors. So I can't imagine, again, it's probably more, but just I would guessing. say, yeah. 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 We, we know you're just guessing. I'm just, I'm thinking like the Crown XTI now, because mm -hmm. like, man, have you seen how much the, I, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've been keeping an eye on it. But the Crown XTI, like 2502 or 2002, which is what I use. I don't know what that's the XLS 2502. I, I think they're up to like a thousand dollars now. Um, and yeah. they're not, I mean, I'm not saying they're bad amplifiers, they're fine. It's 800 watts by two, basically. I can run two 800 watt amps and be fine and be happy with yeah. it. It's not anything, um, you know, and that's assuming I, I do bridge mode, right? Actually, it's 2000 watts bridged for them. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I kind of wish there was a better side subwoofer amplifier. And you're right. You don't need the distortion, but I like the roll off on that amplifier. Like that roll off looks nice. You know, I'm no, like, oh, I mean, wow. and if you're, if your sub is for, doesn't go under four ohms, you can bridge a 502 and get a thousand Watts out of it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean if you go, you can bridge a 502 and get a thousand four watts ohms at or four two ohms. ohms. Four ohms. You can't. If you bridge it, you cannot. I cannot uh, oh, give you your warranty if right. you are driving under four ohms because then it's seen two ohms, and that's a lot of draw on it. Two ohms each channel. So, so you're saying you could get a two channel five oh two, and 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 take those into a thousand watt like those two amplifier boards. You would then. Bridge into a thousand watts. Oh, it's one amplifier board. A five hundred two. Oh one yeah, it's two and one two right. channels on it. You bridge. I've had people bridge them, and you can get a thousand watts into eight ohms out of. Or actually, it's a thousand watts into four ohms, twelve hundred watts into eight ohms. So right now, this is actually uh, I didn't realize it. So you, so someone could potentially order this from you. Would you bridge it for them, or would they bridge it? I've, it's actually, um, and I have a guide for the section on my website it's all external bridging so then you it's easy basically all you would do is um and i tell you the easiest way to do sure is that. go to blue jeans cable and tell them you want a y splitter an xlr y splitter cable with one of the male ends wired out of phase or inverted then gotcha. all you would do is on you'd hook that up and then um the red from the speaker or sub would go to the red on the normal xlr channel the one that hasn't been inverted and then the black from the speaker or sub would go to the red on the inverted channel. Now you're bridged, you're done. Then at any point you can reverse it and use it as a two channel without opening it up or changing it. So really that's only 750 bucks and that would give you the same. The only thing you're missing is your DSP. But if you have right. something that has direct bass control or something else that you want to use for that, then, then you're set anyway. Yeah. That's that's not bad. So basically, 750 bucks, you can get yourself a nice, a real nice sub amplifier. Wow. Yeah, like I said, as long as your sub is not going under four ohms. So I I actually use um, two 21 inch PA subwoofers. So uh, they're both eight ohm rated. So oh well, then you get 1200 yeah. watts out of it actually. Oh well, see that eight ohm well, you get 1200 watts. Well, I, no, because I, I would wire them in parallel to get down to. Oh, so ohms. you'd be at four ohms. Gotcha. So yeah, you'd, yeah, yeah, you'd yeah. be a thousand watts. Yeah. So that that's pretty cool. Did you know that, Justin? You know, it's interesting because when I first looked at your prices, I got a little bit of a sticker shock. Uh, the stuff you sell is a little bit more expensive than the stuff I like to buy. Really, I think it's so <laughs> cheap. That's, so that's so funny. <laughs> and that's fine because you know you 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 because your price so much lower than the people who are running the same amp boards. Uh, and so that's yeah. fine. But now I'm looking at this going, okay, if I sit and start comparing this to a subwoofer plate amp to a Crown XTI, all of a sudden it's like, okay, my initial look was kind of wrong uh, because you're you're landing in a market that's different than the one I usually play around in. So you are I don't think you're that far out of the line price-wise. No, no I, I guess I could probably do a better job advertising for sub-use. 
I've always strayed against it because again, that, that rule of don't go under four ohms. It's not like I can enforce that. If someone bought it and thought I'm going to run two ohms on it and it burns up, I can't prove it'd be, I'm not the type of person be like, Oh, you got, I can't give you warranty. You got to tell me what happened. Give me pictures. Like I've always tried to kind of fault proof it. So if someone reaches out to me and asks, Hey, what do you have for a subwoofer? Then I can kind of get into them and explain it and ask questions. But I would hate to like, I guess I've always been hesitant to, to advertise the subwoofer bridged option for someone who just might buy it and overlook kind of the, the thing there. Don't go under four ohms. All right. So we're, we're running, we ran out of time a while ago, but I've been having too much fun talking. Uh, yeah, I'm um, fine. Yeah. Sorry about that, but I'm fine. Now, this no, is no, great. No, I'm no. learning a lot. Uh, this is a, educational for me. This is an entirely new world. So it's kind of cool to sit back and enjoy. So, so how long do you think someone could possibly realistically, I should say realistically, realistically expect one of your amplifiers to last them? So you don't have to really ask about mine in general because the modules and amps, amps built on the modules have been on the market for the end, like the MP series that I sell have been out since 2016, 2017. And if you go on the forums, there's maybe once every, I don't know, like on ASR, maybe once every couple, four, five, six months, there might be someone who bought an amp with like an NC252 or an NC502 has had it for like seven or eight years. And now maybe there's an issue with like thermal or something like that. But for my customers, I can give you, for my experience, for my answer last three years, I think I've done, I've had over for the Hypex, like the MP series, I've sold over a thousand different amps minimum of those. And I probably had three warranty replacements due to defect of the module. That's, that's, that's what the years. Um, the Purify is a little, it's actually been out, I think, since 2018, 2019, and working great. I think what brings this up is I still have a one year warranty on my website. Um, I've been thinking about changing it because based on the data I now have. But again, like NAD is a huge user of the Purify modules and they offer their five year warranty. So it's, as the technology modules are, they're not any more or less prone, in my opinion, to comparable um, current class AB type amplifiers. Like, I don't know. Right. I guess to me, it's not like it. Emotiva is kind of a, one of the or um, Outlaw Audio are kind of comparable class AB amps in the price range and stuff. And um, I don't know. It's the same you would expect from stuff like that. So just based on the market, other people who have made them and my experience now being in this three years, failure rates or what to expect from them, I have no hesitation of how long they'll last, being at least 5, 10, 15 years. Um, I obviously can't speak again to some people. If you buy this amp and stick it in a tiny shelf enclosed with absolutely no ventilation, there's obviously use cases that I can't account for. Um, but when used properly, no issues. So I've got a question for you. Um, you being a you know a small business, I'm kind of curious. Are you um, hand building these to order? Someone places an order, then you start the build, or do you have them sitting in stock? If I ordered one, yeah. would you ship it today, or would it take a week and a half to build? Uh, right now, it's about 10, 10 days, fourteen max. No, I build everyone to order. Um, I have all, excellent. If something says back ordered, like my Purify right now, it's because I'm waiting on Purify. It's not that I'm not capable of building the parts. Like, I need more time. Um, Purify actually has a back order of the module itself at the moment, but for anything on the site, it's 10 to 14 days because I have all the parts, I have everything, but I just sit down and build orders as they come. So and the, got inventory the, 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 parts, the reason why there's a wait is because there is always kind of a backlog. There's I'm always getting orders. It's not that <laughs> I, it's not that I'm lazy and don't catch up. It's that even if I put in a really long day, like, I mean, I work on the weekend when I build them, I'm a little, I'm a little spoiled because I build them in a nice kind of living room setup all by my own, where I get to, you know, on Sundays I can put football on and just build some amps, fill some orders. So I'm always building. So it's not, again, not laziness. It's just there's so many orders and interest that the back order is basically how long it takes me to catch up. But you're not a Browns fan, are you? 
No, actually, I'm not. Oh, whew. I was like, man, you got a lot of time on your hands because they're not doing anything. <laughs> no, no, not a Browns fan. Um, I'm actually a Patriots fan, so this year it's terrible. Oh, well, it's, it's been terrible. just as bad. They lost like yeah. 34 but, uh, to nothing. Uh, luckily, the rest of my family has always been Lions fans, so I get to kind of help oh. them cheer. So they're doing good. But um, but no, yeah, so it, it everything's built to order, and that also allows me that it's easier that I can do customizations a lot quicker if someone wants a certain – like I said, if someone wants, you know, two channels of high power and six channels of lower power, I can do that all in one chassis rather than do two different amps, stuff like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So you can actually tell them which outputs like channel one and channel two are the higher outputs or whatever. Yes. That's a, that's a great idea. I like that. Um, All right, Justin, I think we should get going. My kids just knocked on the door and said, can we watch some football? I, I'm a Packers fan. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy the Lions are actually doing well. I wish they would have done well when Barry Sanders was there or Megatron, but I know when they had like Hall of Fame players. Yeah, Yeah. I know. That's what my dad wishes, but Hall of Fame players. I, I still am under the the belief that both Barry Sanders and Calvin Johnson in their respective wide receiver running back are some of the the best to ever play the game. I, I would, I would argue that Barry Sanders was was the best running back ever. Oh, and, and people have to remember, everything he did, he, he still had another good seven or eight years left. <laughs> oh, yeah, and he's like, I'm not playing for you anymore. Yeah, I'm, he's, done. I'm done. No, it's actually nice. My parents treated themselves to, as part of their um, ongoing retirement of like things to do. Just this time last year, they put in for season tickets for the Lions, and they got them. And it's funny because now the Lions finally have a, a, bit, a, a, <laughs> a wait team. list for season tickets. That's how good they're oh. like. Yeah, so I was happy they got him, but it's it's nice uh, having a, a home team uh, that's kind of good again. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Well, it, it's nice to actually have a team that's worth watching. I mean, I, I grew up in Illinois. We talked about this before the show. Yeah. All my friends are Bears fans. They haven't had anything to root for since 1985. So you know, like, they're, they're still like, they're like, you know, when, when Rogers said that he owned the Packers. Yeah. And stuff. Last, was it last year or the year before? I, I, I wore a, every year a Favre jersey and I put Packers owner on, or I'm sorry, a Rogers jersey, put Packers owner, or I'm sorry, Bears owner on it. And, but it's true. I mean, it's nice to have a team that's actually doing something. I know the Packers aren't going to do anything this year. So I'm, no, and it's, it's like you said, it's nice because I can actually at least be entertained. I used to get Sunday ticket and pay for that because, you know, Patriots fan, we don't get the in market their games. Uh, but I stopped doing that a few years ago. It was just wasn't worth it for the money anymore. And now it's like, oh, at least my local channel will have a Lions game that I'll find interesting. <laughs> Nick, before we wrap up, what do you got coming up on yeah. your channel in the future? What's 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 happening in the world of uh, Toys DIY? I'm shutting it down. It's on. It's off the market. <laughs> now you know what I, I I have some pretty cool stuff. So a lot of people think I hate sound bars. I don't hate sound bars. Okay. I, I hate television speakers. Yep. And then sound bars are like the second least thing I hate. But it's like, it's one of those things that I would much rather you have a sound bar than anything else, right? Like I'd rather you have the yeah. sound bar than listen to your TV speakers. And I, I, so even if it's a cheap sound bar, most of the time it sounds better than the TV speakers. No. So I have a sound bar that I'm going to be reviewing. <laughs> I have no idea what it sounds like. I haven't heard it yet. But actually, I did open it up and I, I found it to be pretty interesting because it has everyone wants wireless rear surround on their sound bar, right? Well, there's no such thing as wireless rear surround because you have an amplifier in yeah. there. So you have to plug it into power. The problem with plugging rear surrounds into power is there's never a good outlet nearby no. where you want to plug into power. It just isn't. So this company did something pretty interesting. They have the subwoofer power the rear speakers, and then you just run RCA cables to the rear speakers, whatever length you need. And it comes with some, and I like that better because you can place the subwoofer in the rear somewhere because it's a small subwoofer anywhere. You're going to want it near the couch probably. So I like the fact that you can plug it in and then run those rear speakers, you know, wherever you want near there with just an RCA because you're going to have some type of wiring. And I like that yeah. idea better. So I found that interesting. So I'll, I'll have that out. I have no idea how good it's going to be. So guys, if it stinks, I'm sorry, but you'll find out. Um, and then I don't, you know, I don't really have a lot going on. I have a bunch of parts next to me to build a really cool boom box. We've been talking about that 
on the channel. One, one of my friends has asked me to build a boom box for them. And so we're going to be using car speakers and they're the Polk audio DB plus 6.5. I can see them cause they're on the floor right there. Um, and I'm going to test them to see how good those speakers are. Cause I don't know. I have in my mind that they're going to measure terribly, but I, I'm, I'm very curious. I want to know like how, you know, where are the, there's a crossover already built into them. So is the crossover built? So it's balanced out. Is it built more for protection of the drivers? What's going on there? So I have a feeling that it's built more for protection. So I have this on air right now. I've never tested them. They're still brand new in the box. Actually, I'll prove it. I've never opened these. They're brand new in a box. They're still sealed. So Ooh. that's my feeling. I have no idea if that's going to be the case. So I'm going to test those. And I'm going to try to test those this week if I can. So those are the two big things I got going on. You're, you're muted, Justin. Of course. I just dropped a video where I attempted to set a car audio fuse holder on fire. I failed <laughs> to do so, but I was able to get it to melt a little bit and kind of show how if you're using undersized wire and making a bad connection that you are going to damage that fuse holder and, and you know, potentially destroy your vehicle. So yeah, hopefully some more that. people will watch that. And so people will learn from the, you know, the mistakes that I deliberately made in the video. And I've uh, recently been rebuilding my amp dyno test station. I'm going to try to do some amp tests between now and the end of the year. And I have found the most hideous amplifier on Amazon. And I can't nice. wait to test it out. It is, it is, it is shameful how ugly this amp is. I need to get some pictures up for my patrons so they can see it. Um, it might be a couple of weeks before it comes out, but it is the most hideous amplifier on Amazon. And it's going to be a fun one. <laughs> but who knows? It might, it might be a great amp. I just might be, it might just be ugly. It might just be ugly. <laughs> all right, guys, that's all we have for tonight. We hope you guys have a great Monday, Dylan. It was fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And thanks for having me. See y'all later.